I can tell you what I told that scoundrel Volothamp Gidarm, though if it winds up in another unauthorised book, I have friends who will track you down and turn you into a sapient puddle of slime. Consider that a warning. A polite warning, my friend. Alright, let's see. <clears throat> Candlekeep on the Sword Coast is a famous landmark near the city of Baldur's Gate. It is a citadel dedicated to learning. Best described as a fortified library that stands on a volcanic horn or crag overlooking the sea. It is a many-towered fortress, once the home of the famous Sierra Alando, and preserves his predictions along with all the written records and learning of the realms that can be assembled. The price for any traveller to enter the keep's fabulous vaults and towers full of knowledge is simply a book, though those wishing to examine any writing in the keep's library in greater detail must gift Candlekeep with a book that adds something of value to the keep's archives. This is subject to a lot of different factors, of course, but uh, I've seen the volumes and tomes valued at no less than 10,000 gold pieces can be handed over by some of the most renowned sages and wizards in the realms. Those who call Candlekeep their home refer to themselves as the Avowed and pay respects to all the gods of Toril, though they are obviously dedicated shrines to the gods most closely associated with learning. The Avowed also purchase certain books brought to them. They hire agents in some secrecy to track down and procure specific writings they desire to possess, and a rare few of the Avowed travel far and wide as part of the service there, seeking to add information not yet recorded anywhere. There is some bias, admittedly. Not just anyone and everyone is granted leave to study in Candlekeep. Normally a young applicant would be sponsored by an, a known mage of power, so many books given to Candlekeep in payment, therefore, are minor spellbooks, and it is in spellbooks that the Keep earns a hefty amount of coin to its own coffers. The Avowed and the Sages in Residence are a community, but there is a system of governance headed by the Keeper of the Tomes. Assisted by the First Reader, the Second in Authority, and traditionally the most learned Sage of the Monastery, there are up to eight Great Readers under these two officers, who are assisted by the Chanter, the Guide, and the Gate Warden. The Chanter leads the endless chant of Alondo's prophecies that wends its way around the Citadel day and night and continuous utterance of the Sage's predictions. This is not nearly as distracting as it sounds though. Over the centuries this chant has become quite lovely really. The Chanter is not alone in this activity of course. They have three or four assistants who carry the title of the Voices. The Voices for the North, Voice of the East and the Voices of the South. The guide is in charge of teaching acolytes, and the gate warden deals with visitors, the security of, and the supplies of the community. And with the clergy, who are regarded as honoured guests rather than part of the keep's avowed hierarchy, it's easy enough for visitors not to see the distinction between the clergy and the sages. But the joke is, the avowed will be carrying a stack of books, the clerics will just be carrying one. The Citadel bears mighty many-layered wards that prevent anything from burning except wicks and candle wax, including wax golems which have become very popular over the last century. I don't know how we would live without them to be honest, and I find it very pleasant to have such a wealth of beehives, gardeners, apiarists, and personally, a ready supply of truly exceptional mead. There are magical wards that prevent the operation of teleportational magics and many other destructive spells. Kill all moulds and insects, such as paper wasps, the bane of our lovely beehives as well as our books. Prohibit the entry of bookworms and have other secret properties, which I cannot speak of. They don't call us the avowed for nothing. Because of these wards, candle lamps are often used, but no paper can ignite anywhere in the keep. An additional ward prohibits entry into the inner rooms except by those bearing an enchanted token of candle keep. A simple square stone with the symbol of the avowed on it. The symbol is a castle with a flame above it, though some have said it looks more like a writing quill tip a little bit, and I can see that. The inner rooms are where the most powerful magical tomes are kept, and where none but the great readers may go, except in the direct company of the keeper or the first reader. The central highest fortress of the keep is surrounded by a terraced rock garden of many trees and many beehives, with natural springs rising and bubbling down the rocks in small cascades and pools. These beautiful grounds, much favoured reading spots at the time of year when the climate is more pleasant, descend to a ring of buildings around the inside of the massive outer walls. Guest houses, stables, granaries and a warehouse, an infirmary, a temple of Ogma and the shrines of Denier, uh, Gond and Melil. The shrine to Denier has become more popular over the last generation, I'm told. Except of cases of illness or when someone joins the order as an acolyte, no visitor can remain in Candlekeep for more than 10 days at a time, or enter the monastery less than a month after leaving it. 
is that times an inconvenient rule, but it is a tradition honoured for centuries, laid down with great wisdom by the avowed of old. An order in the keep is kept by the gate warden's five under officers, usually referred to as the gate warden's staff, consisting of the four watchers who take turns patrolling the keep and watching the land and sea around it from its tallest towers, and the keeper of the portal, more or less a gate guard, but they, along with the watchers, all have a dozen avowed assistants of their own, who are without exception highly experienced warriors, who take their job very seriously indeed. These under officers are well equipped with powerful magical items as you would expect from a fortified library of magical knowledge, and that's all I can say on that matter. Of the non-avowed, acolytes are robed in black. You will wonder where they are most of the day, but to just check the study rooms and you'll find them learning languages, letters, bookbinding, and some minor magics if they're capable. They may end up working in the kitchens or gardens, but they all start out with a fairly good education on the basics. This is a library, after all. Seekers wear robes of mauve, though they're not really a religious organisation. This is mainly why they are often referred to as monks, because of the robes that they wear. Though anyone who has stayed in rooms along the west walls in winter will soon un understand why thick robes make perfect practical sense to those living in the keep year-round. The seekers are the lowest ranks of the residents. They do research and they fetch and they carry. Above them are the scribes, who copy artworks in order to compile books from various sources for the library for sale. Only those who reside or are granted to study in the library are allowed to write. Visitors are forbidden to do so. Over the scribes are the chanter and the readers, from whose ranks the officers of their vow are filled, and who uh, we vote to fill the vacancies. All the under officers wear brown homespun, while holders of the high officers wear robes of various colours that bear adornments of gold thread and stripes of white. Only the keeper of the tomes can wear robes all white. Travellers who enter the keep clad, all in white, can expect to be stripped on the spot or escorted from the grounds entirely. The current keeper of the tomes is still Ulrund, though he is certainly centuries old by now and quite a formidable mage. He is also a bit grumpy, so it's well not to cross him. He's been the keeper for such a long time, I can barely imagine anyone else stepping into his velvet boots. He doesn't suffer fools, and those who show him any disrespect can wind up on the end of a nasty enchantment. Unfortunately, all petitioners who enter the central keep must sit at Elruant's left shoulder for at least one evening feast meal and endure his searching questions. This is harrowing, I can tell you this for certain. Elruant learns more about the goings-on in the realms from these quiet interrogations than any amount of magical scrying I would wage a solid coin on it. The current first reader is about the third or fourth to hold office since I came to the keep. I take it that working directly under Old Ruin can be a profession wrought with stress. It's certainly not a role I aspire to, thank you. I am fine with being on the road or in the wild so often that the residents sometimes assume I'm already dead. Speaking of the dead, I'd strongly advise you against going down into the catacombs of the keep carved into the very granite of the bluff. They go deep. There is a whole series of tombs and sepulchres that serve as a resting place for a great number of sages of Candlekeep, and they are guarded by the most fearsome spirit, long ago bound to the keep and sworn to protect it and the avowed. The catacombs are the haunt of the silver dragon Merim, long departed but certainly quite real. The great library of Candlekeep is considered to be the largest and most robust collection of scholarly writings, lore and knowledge in all of Faerun. Largest in what does not mean the oldest, most complete or the best, but it certainly is grand to behold. There are huge amounts of books. However, with such scope comes its own problems, as the bookshelves also contain a seemingly endless amount of paltry and insignificant documents such as recipes, song lyrics, diaries of fairly unremarkable individuals as well, well, all sorts really. Connected to the library are dozens of towers known as the Necessariums, that offer ample space to study and read in peace. The hearth is the great eating hall where everyone mingles and evening meals are served, including feasts. The shrines of Denir, Gond and Melil are connected there, while the temple to Ogma, the house of the binder as we call it, is a separate building. Oh, and of course deep beneath the keep are all the secret vaults, with exactly what your wildest imaginations can conjure up. Um, that's where they're all located, but I'm sworn to secrecy about that of course. You can hire the services of the Sage of Candlekeep, of course, but those services are highly sought after and cost at least twice as much as you would expect to pay, even in Waterdeep. 
Books sold by the keep range from 100 to 10,000 gold pieces in value. It's true, the finest spell books in the realms are made on the premises. These premises have stood here on the bluff 1693 years. Contrary to some folk tales, the keep predates the arrival of the famous prophet Alondo, who didn't arrive here until 275 years after it was built. Over the centuries, all sorts of things have happened in this place. Wonders and disasters, as you can imagine. The place even got taken over at one point. Candlekeep has but one absolute rule. Those who destroy knowledge with ink, fire or sword are themselves destroyed. Here, books are more valuable than people. Let's put uh, pull back from the keep, since I can't really talk about what else goes on there in much more detail anyway, and look at the surrounding land. Candlekeep is right on the very shores of a rocky coastline, pounded by waves year-round. The granite boulders and cliffs are craggy and dangerous enough, but well worth risking for the excellent fishing and a particularly bountiful stock of rock oysters, crabs and such. The crab cakes cooked in the keep kitchens are particularly good. I would say they should be favouring famous. The western walls of the keep are bombarded by mists and storms and sea spray from the Sea of Swords. In the winter months, this actually becomes covered in ice. The walls are strong enough to deal with this, but the walkways, steps and less insulated towers on that side have to be abandoned for part of the year due to this hazard. Likewise, you can imagine how blustery and storm racked the coast is on the winter, but for the rest of the year, the climate is temperate and not um, often very unpredictable. The landscape is made up of bluffs and hills with some open grasslands and dots of woods all over the place. There are a few locations marked on most maps, but Towers, abbeys, farmsteads, and the keeps of lords who govern and protect small communities dot the landscape. There are only a few frequently travelled roads, so it's wise to either take on the services of a local guide, follow along with a caravan or wagon who knows where they're going, or stop frequently to check with locals if you're going in the right direction. Keep in mind though, you don't have to go too far from Candlekeep or Beragost before people answer questions with a drawn arrow pointed at your heart. This is goblin and hobgoblin territory after all. Uh, past Beragos you get closer to the Cloud Peaks mountain range which marks the hard border between the Sword Coast and Arm. You're mostly okay if you stick to the, the Coastway Trail. It's fairly well signposted though not always obvious in the summer months as the grass grows quite tall on it and it's not cobbled all the way by any means. When you look at maps in this region they look like ripples on a grassland but the hills and valleys are a lot more winding and steep than you might expect and there are plenty of interesting things to see relics of old kingdoms old religions old druid landmarks ruined keeps and wild growing fruit trees also the whole coast and hills between here the cloud peaks the green fields the river uh, chiantha and the heavy forests of the cloakwood and the wood of sharp teeth which we just call the teeth is full of deer. So common is venison on the menu that many people think that the western heartland refers to hearts, mature red deer, and they spell it accordingly. I'm not prone to correcting them as I think it's a fine and descriptive name for the place. It should be the land of the deer. Beragost is a bustling township. It's quite a bit, well it's grown a bit over the last hundred years or so. Oh, it must be over 3,000 people there now. It's a popular stop for many passing merchant caravans of course. The traffic stretches all along the Sword Coast from the mountain pass leading to Arm all the way to Waterdeep or the Frozen Far. You can also pay for passage on carriages these days and there is always, always work for skilled fighters with a good reputation with the wagons and caravans that travel through here. Those who can demonstrate skills with magic can expect very good payment for their services where a group of merchants will travel together, each contributing to the pool of protection as they pass through the mountains in a wagon train. Some of the more remote hill country and particularly around the edges of the large forests, um, they, they, yeah, they need their guards. Beragost has an interesting history as it really sprang up thanks to the building of a wizard school, but that was destroyed centuries ago um, by fire, well I think it was fire, it was certainly from uh, some rivals from Kalimshan I believe, and since then the farming community made good on all the traders passing through and became quite a hub. Locating, uh, it located as it is halfway between Gold, Baldur's Gate and Arm, as it, well, it would never have gotten so successful, I think, if it were not for the Temple of Lathanda that is uh, located there. I must warn the more adventurous that the local town council of Beragos has, f at least for the last century, kept a close guard on the ruins of the wizard school and will not treat a trespass on those grounds lightly. It's a crime that they will punish to disturb anything in that place. I doubt any passing through the town would take the clergy on, um, well it's 200 strong 
local militia and a large rose-coloured church with the high spires uh, with all of the acolytes walking around in the characteristic yellow garb. It's an imposing monument located in the centre of Beragos, just to the east side of the coastway road that cuts through the centre of town. The Song of the Morning Temple is very aptly named as it's home to four fae sirens, beautiful creatures who look like, well, they look quite human aside from a yellow or green skin tone and they've got this lustrous silver hair. Although I do hear that their, their hair comes in different colours. They've all got silver hair for some reason. The songs of Lathander they sing during the day are extremely melodious. Um, as you can imagine, they uh, reside in uh, private pools in a garden on the temple grounds uh, deep in the centre, ensconced behind quite high walls for their own protection. Uh, they have ensured the popularity of the centre of faith and it's grown quite steadily, as has its political power and ability to keep law and order along the vital trade route of the Sword Coast. It costs 10 gold coins per night to stay on the temple grounds. They are extensive outbuildings and surrounding the temple of course there's um, the sick and the seriously injured can stay longer as they receive special care from the priesthood. Also on the east side of the town are the temple's potato fields, herb gardens and all the hills where the clergy tend flocks of sheep. The whole town has an excellent potato and mutton meals at low cost since most folk prefer venison and they almost have, uh, that. well, they almost have to give away the old sheep. They are raised for their wool, and there's lots of industry around that commodity locally, including all the robes worn at Candlekeep, uh, produced in Beragost. While shepherding their livestock among the foothills, the temple's priests keep a watchful eye over the unguarded eastern expanse of Beragost. They also afforded a view of the ruins of the old wizard school, so yeah, they guard the approach. On the other side of the road, you can find Thunderhammer Smithy, still owned and operated by the Ethereum family, but the premises has greatly expanded into a school of metal craft, and this is one of the places you can actually have a magical weapon crafted for yourself. The Thunderhammer School is probably one of the most important features of the township, and another reason Beragost has no doubt got a bright future ahead of it. Merchants still do most of their business in the Red Sheaf Inn. They never hire entertainers there at the end, but the service is excellent and quick. And this is the place to go if you want to talk to a merchant. Felderpost's Inn is still there, still popular with the elderly. The place is very comfortable, has a daytime entertainment menu, uh, games for groups of people. And there's a, a local rock rolling game I find I quite enjoy while I was there. Also, you have to try the cheese and cucumber buns and the mushroom tarts. Also, the cold potato soup in this town is excellent. I mean, it doesn't sound appetizing, but take my word for it. The Burning Wizard was and still is a very busy tavern, popular with travellers and locals alike, a great place for standing room only fun and entertainment, popular with entertainers. It is served by the acolytes of Lathander, who certainly learn a lot about people there and of keeping the peace. The interior of the tavern is decorated with thousands of trinkets and ornaments from all across Faerun, donated by travellers over the decades. There's also a few other inns that come and go, those looking for the jovial jugular, uh, their place burnt down decades ago under highly suspicious circumstances. Rumours that there are secret smuggler passages under the town that lead to old drow tunnels which are now sealed off with ageing magical wards are entirely true. Venture there at your own risk, but as with many things in this town, be sure the clergy doesn't find out what you're up to. So, heading out of town. The forests in this region are worthy of note, as all forests are. Be on the lookout for bands of half-ogres at all times particularly in the west of the township. Cloakwood is an ancient, thickly grown forest that extends from a coastal peninsula and hugs the shore. The coastway borders its uh, inland edge, that roadway. Don't let the maps deceive you. You can travel 60 miles from the coast before reaching the inland edge of the Cloakwood. It hides many secrets and a lot of history, a lot of elven history. Most folks avoid the place because it is in the last days as a refuge of the older world. So it's full of beasts, monsters, and vicious fey. Until only a few decades ago, scholars at Candid Keep were quite certain that several portals were actively connected from ancient sites in the forest to other locations across the multiverse. Now the portals are sealed, it would seem, but the legacy of such gateways is always a lingering thing. In those woods, you can commonly find giant spiders, quicklings, satyrs, sturges, corrids, hangman trees, and other exotic plants and creatures. I'm sure many that have never before seen, been seen or documented uh, residing in that place. The largest structure of the modern age in the forest itself is the ruins of Feldane Manor, 
and its clock tower, a site severely haunted from what I've heard. There's also some abandoned mines, though I have no idea who would have ventured into those woods to go prospecting. I suppose, in theory, if the woods ever became less savage, the more sandy shore of the peninsula and the sheltered cove facing the southern uh, tip towards Candlekeep would make for an excellent harbour settlement. With the riches in uh, lumber and the potential mineral wealth, who knows? Perhaps one day it could be civilised, but it is very far from that day now, I assure you. Travelling the Coastway Road, there is a has long been a waypoint popular for resting wagon teams and weary bones called the Friendly Arm Inn. The arm is actually a fully walled hamlet between Baldersgate and Berigost and is a safe haven for the occasional soul, soul who comes speeding out of the cloakwood as though the very hounds of the Nine Hells are after them. The stone keep houses large and clean rooms. There's a temple, a handful of houses and extensive stables. The Friendly Arm Inn is guarded at all times by the locals who insist that all weapons be left at the gate of the hamlet. They also adhere to an old practice where all visiting wizards, fighting monks and clerics must tie one of their thumbs to their belt. The inn has some interesting features. First is the collection of mementos and trophies from the old adventuring days of the original renovator of the keep, now almost a century old, who, as legend has it, slew an evil servant of Baal on the site and took it for himself. And to add a twist to it, the adventuring heroes included a gnome and his wife, who became the keepers of uh, well, the keep's new owners. This explains why the temple is somewhat unexpectedly dedicated to Gaal Glittergold and with a lavish decoration of gems and gold nuggets, another reason why the hamlet is so well protected. There was a rumour that the barmaids in the Friendly Inn are actually small iron golems disguised as, as humans by illusionary magic. As the barmaids are all married and often to the formidable town guardsmen, this may as well be true. So, there we have barely over 100 miles of the massive continent of Faerun, but a good start to our journey.